Hey, John, great to have you on the program today. Hi, Pat. We're very pleased to be here. Now, John, you're known as the WOW Marketing King. How did you come up with the concept of the WOW Factor? Well, you know, my philosophy for any business, uh, and I, I think it is probably the philosophy you have in life in general, that if it doesn't have WOW, don't bother doing it. And uh, I guess some people might call it gosh factor or they might call it their unique selling point in their business. I call it WOW factor. Hey John, you know, if people say, yeah, is it hard to, to do? Is it hard to get? I mean, can, can everyone in any industry have a, have a WOW factor? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, even accountants, would you believe? No. <laughs> It's a bit tougher for them, but yeah, they can have a wow factor. Yeah. Now, if I'm a business owner or, you know, just, uh, just someone who's, I've got a job, how do I put that into my, into my world to be more effective? Well, you know, I, I was doing a seminar just recently, uh, Pat, and uh, my audience is full of business owners. And mm -hmm. uh, I was saying to them that there was a client that I have uh, in the real estate business. And you know what they call themselves? They call themselves unreal estate. Wow. Now, you know, some might say, look, that's a bit corny, uh, mm. and each to his own, but I think that's brilliant. Uh, mm. They've immediately mm. categorised themselves as unlike any other real estate, so they've called themselves unreal estate. Gosh. And that's their wow factor. They've created an organic wow factor. Now, mm. Richard Branson has an organic wow factor. Right. Anything that he has to do with has a unique selling point. Yeah. But a lot of businesses don't have an organic wow factor, so they have to create one. And if you said to me, well, what's an artificial wow factor? I'd probably say... Uh, and certainly, you know, this particular company didn't need one, but Woolworths, mm. four cents a litre off the petrol. Now, when mm. they launched that a few years ago, they were the only supermarket in Australia that gave four cents a litre discount off their petrol. Mm. That's an artificial wow factor. So, so John, what are some of the uh, examples that you've used in your life? I mean, I haven't sort of gone in and, and shared the, the big thing that you did, which really, you know, took you to another level. Do you want to share a little bit about that? And, well, well, thank you for well, thank you. well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to show off. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, You're welcome, mate. Oh, well, I'm normally a shy <laughs> Look, little devil. This is the place to show off if you're going to do it. This is the place to be, John, I'm telling you. You know what? If my wife watches this interview, she's going to go, oh, no, you've started him on that whole Seinfeld thing. Um, <laughs> she's a member of our Mini Mindset Club, mate, just so that you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, look, I think uh, what you're referring to is the Seinfeld thing. Mm. And uh, one of my clients happens to be a building society here in Australia. Um, mm. And whilst they're a big business, they're, you know, they're a $4.5 billion business, they're nothing oh. like the Commonwealth Bank or any yeah, of the right. big banks in America. Yeah. And I was able a few years ago to convince uh, none other than Jerry Seinfeld to be the front man for all of their advertising. It's interesting, as I was driving here this morning, I was uh, driving behind a bus and then last night, and I said to some of my team, John Dwyer, John Dwyer, John, everywhere I turn, how did you do that? I mean, that, that's a pretty big call. Matter of fact, it was on television all over the United States. It was. Matter of fact, all over the world, actually. It was indeed. And uh, when you say you're driving behind a bus and you said, John Dwyer, John Dwyer, you saw me on the bus, did you? No, I saw Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, you, you on behind, the back of the yeah, bus. Yeah, yeah like, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say something then, but I better not. But uh, yeah. no, we saw the Jerry Seinfeld and, and obviously the, the bank there. And it was just yeah. It's yeah. incredible because, you know, I, I automatically thought of you. Thanks, How mate. did you do that? Thanks, mate. Um, well, yeah, look, uh, it's, um, it's something I think that uh, is probably, you know, any business can take a leaf out of this. I asked, simple mm. as that. Um, mm. I even asked Jerry Seinfeld when I met him for the first time a few years back, why did you do this? I mean, mm. I know the sort of money you make from residuals from the yeah, Seinfeld. Gosh, yeah. Why did you do this? And he said, well, number one, I've never been asked from Australia before. Uh, and he said, number two, you asked me to be cheeky and that's what I do for a living. Right. Because Jerry in all of the ads, uh, he's mm. very cheeky. He basically, yeah. um, he, he bags out the banks on the greater <laughs> behalf. And number three, he said, you gave me creative mm. control. Now, any of these big stars, they do mm. want creative control. Mm. And he loves Australia's, you know, Australian sense of humour. Yeah. Do you find, you know, like one of the things that no one expected it. You got they it. They really didn't. You got it. How do you deliver the unexpected? I mean, you know, from a real estate agent to you know, a lady working in a bakery to, you know, the guy who's a business owner. How can you deliver the unexpected to people? Um, look, a lot of marketing people have this philosophy, but I don't know that they practice it. And it's a matter of interrogating yourself as a business owner mm. and saying, what is it that I have that's unique? Mm. And it can't just be customer service. Yeah. Because if the Hilton Hotel came out with an advertisement in today's paper and mm. said, we have great customer service, mm. everyone would say, well, we expect that. It's the Hilton Hotel. Mm. But if they came out with a page in the paper and said, when you stay here in the next week, we will give you a complimentary breakfast in bed mm. and free car parking, mm. all of a sudden, that's a wow factor. That's yeah. something very different from any other hotel. So yeah. I say to all business owners, look into your business and try and find something that's unique from any other carpet cleaner or from any other accountant. And if you don't, then have a brainstorm. Uh, I mean, you know, my philosophy at the Institute of Wow is that you sit down and have a brainstorm with your team 
and you will be amazed what comes out of that. So what happens if I'm a solo operator? I don't have a team. I'm just, you know, how do I do it? How do I? How can I brainstorm? What could I do? You look for people like you, and you look for people like me. You do, mm -hmm. and and you're a great advocate of you uh, surround yourself with positive thinkers, absolutely, yeah. with um, with um, people with imagination. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the Disney Company. Uh, I love Steven Spielberg. I love George Lucas. I love all of that sort of stuff. So, over the years, when I'm in Disneyland, I'm actually looking at the bricks in Main Street, mm -hmm. and admiring the fact that they're three quarter size. So mm -hmm. it gives the um, it gives the psychological uh, message to me that you know you're actually in fantasy land. Everything yeah. else is so much smaller, and yeah. it's all those psychological tricks that you pick up and take home to your business. So if you are an owner operator, mm. surround yourself with, if you don't mind me showing off, people like you and me. Yeah. You know, John, um, I'm going to get into your personal world here a little bit because uh, I've seen you present, and I've got to say, look, without doubt, from a marketing perspective and the wow factor, you, you there's no one comes anywhere near you. Oh, thank you. And thank you. Um, and, uh, and by the way, that's not a paid endorsement. Uh, but, uh, I was just about to get the $50 but, yeah, but, but, um, but John, you actually put this to work in your own private world when you were trying to sell your house. Mm. And mm. our theme this month is, you know, getting people to buy into your dream, selling the dream. How do you sell the dream? And obviously you had a home, you want a different lifestyle. What, how can we, one, how did you get them to do that on a personal level? Not just business, but on a personal level. Yeah. Two, how do you get people to buy into your dream? Just some practical tools there. Very similar to you. Um, and that is I, I inject passion into pretty much everything I do. Mm. And uh, I guess if you had the Institute of WOW and you didn't have passion, then mm. I'd be out of business. But mm. uh, if someone employs my services as a marketing consultant, mm. you want someone that's going to wear a bright tie and who is extroverted. You mm. don't want someone that comes across like an accountant. So therefore, yeah. I guess by the very, you know, very nature of what I do, mm. wow factor marketing, I've got to be extroverted. Mm. But that's me naturally. And uh, you really just have to have passion. If you want someone to, to buy into your dream, no matter mm. what it is, you want clients, prospects mm. to buy into your dream, you have to have passion. And mm. to probably just quickly snapshot that house thing, uh, mm. we were living in a little country town called Gloucester, which is in the Hunter Valley of New South mm. Wales, and we decided mm. to move to the Gold Coast about mm. six or seven years ago. Mm. And uh, as typically, of course, I call myself Mr. Unlucky to yep. the kids. We decided to sell a house at the, uh, at the stage when the boom had busted. And so all the real estate agents in local country towns said, oh, what do you want? And we said, well, you know, it's a nice big property and with a tennis court and a little guest house and 14 acres and a river and canoe. We want a million dollars. And they said, you're dreaming. They, they'd been watching the castle movie. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you're dreaming. Great movie, by the way. Oh, great movie. <laughs> Gave me the vibe. And uh, they said, you're dreaming. You'll get 600, 650. Yeah. Well, of course, my wife and I said, oh, what are we going to do? And I thought, hang on. I'm supposed to be Mr. Wow Factor. Well, why don't I have a shot at this myself? I'm not a real estate agent, but look, I'll do it. So anyway, cut long story short, I put myself on the, uh, on the distressed list with the Sunday mm. papers, the big Sunday papers, and mm. I was able to get a full page in the paper relatively for a, you know, a moderate price. Mm. Went up in a helicopter with a photographer, which is something that a real estate agent wouldn't do. Took yeah. aerial shots of the property with the tennis court and the river and the canoes and everything, little four golf greens and all this sort of rubbish. Mm. And as it turned out, uh, the Sunday that it came out in the Sunday paper, Ray Martin from Current Affair happened to be reading the paper. Wow. He uh, had one of his journalists ring me up and say, do you mind if we bring a helicopter up on Good. Wednesday and do a story. Yep. We did. We got 1.2 million for the house because it appeared on Current Affair for four minutes. Gosh, that's amazing. But what, 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 you couldn't pay for that kind of advertising, could you? No. And it really no. touched a nerve with people. You yeah. Know? How do you define passion? Um, I think dedication and a good work ethic uh, come. Well, I mean, passion is anybody that's that's into what they're doing. Mm. But it's no good being into what you're doing if you don't have a good work ethic mm. and you don't have uh, the goods, you don't have mm. the knowledge. And uh, I would mm. sus you know, I, my advice to anyone, if they feel that they're passionate but they don't have the knowledge, mm. hang around this sort of environment yeah. because you will hang around people that have got passion that will pass it on to you. Mm. I mean, I was just sorry if I don't say, if, if I could just say this, you know that anyone hangs in your environment they become passionate pretty oh, quickly. Thanks, mate. They do. Yeah, well, they it's do. probably the clothes I wear or something like that. But, <laughs> but John, you know, it, it's, um, yeah. it's interesting. Um, I was uh, with Robert Kiyosaki a couple of years ago at an event, and um, uh, we were speaking in South Africa, and he said to me, uh, he, he said, look, I, I want to speak about that guy that just spoke before me. And he pointed to me, I thought, what does he know about me? And he said, I want to speak about passion. And he said, passion is something you love and something you hate and the tension in between the two. And one of the things I, I know about you, John, is that you love seeing people prosper, businesses prosper, mm -hmm. and you hate seeing people struggle. And one of the things that you help them do is really be an expert in their field. How important is that? I mean, you became an expert in real estate overnight, mm -hmm. although you weren't even a real estate agent, you know. How do you become an expert without doing the, you know, studies and everything else? How do you do that? 
Um, look, and, and I won't say fake it because that's wrong. I mean, sure. you know, you can't fake uh, expertise. Mm. Uh, again, I come back to hanging in the right environment. You are the people that you hang with. Mm. And if you do believe that you're the best dry cleaner in town or you're the best hairdresser or you're the best electrician, and you, you, know, you honestly do believe mm. that, then go out and promote yourself as that because mm. one, of the, um, one of the examples I quote from stage, as you know, is Steve Irwin. Now, he was not the only crocodile expert. No, and in fact, yeah. since Steve tragically passed away, there's been a lot of people mm. on TV now that have taken up you know, that mantle. Mm. So he wasn't the only crocodile expert in the world, mm. but because he promoted himself as the expert, mm. we all gravitated to him. Mm. And Don Burke is not the only gardening expert mm. here in Australia, but we gravitate to him. Mm. And, and more recent times, master chefs mm. are not the only chefs in Australia, but we yeah. gravitate to them because mm. they promote themselves as the expert. And you know what's interesting is you talked about passion. They're all passionate about what they do. They are. And, yeah. and even like you look at Steve Irwin's kids, they've just grabbed onto that passion and you see it in them, you know. Look at the environment they grew up in. Exactly. And, and that plays an important part. Now, John, you, uh, you produce a television show called Dreams Can Come True. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. It's quite appropriate, isn't it, for it's, the, it's, it's this perfect. segment? Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Yeah, look, some years ago, um, I, uh, I sold a business I had at the time, which was the uh, bubblegum card business, okay? I took over from Scanlon's Bubblegum back in the 90s and produced the football cards with the stick of bubblegum. Mm. And we did quite well out of that. And when I sold it, I said to my wife, look, I want to give something back. And, uh, and I took six months off and produced a TV show called Dreams Can Come True. Yeah. And we we're very lucky. We sold it to the Channel 10 network. Dale Braithwaite was the host, the former Sherbet oh. singer. Yeah. And we had a lot of fun. And what we did is that we invited the viewing public to send in a request for a dream to be, to be, to be fulfilled, but not for them. Mm. The whole thing about it was that they had to almost be a little evangelistic and, and, and ask for a dream for someone that they knew that was in need. Mm. So we built homes for people. We gave motor cars away. We took them overseas to meet the heroes. And mm. one such example was a little wheelchair athlete. He was only 15 years of age and he suffered from spina bifida. And his parents had spent a lot of money on his illness and they wrote to us and just said, um, well, sorry, some friends of theirs wrote to us and said, is there any chance you could deliver this little boy's dream? All he wanted to do was to go to a Chicago Bulls basketball game. This was yeah. in the 90s when Michael yeah. Jordan was still playing. Yeah. Well, we went one step further. I sent a, uh, a fax in those times to Michael Jordan's office. He happened to be walking past the fax machine at that time, pulled it out, <laughs> said to his secretary, make this happen. So we took the little boy in the wheelchair over to um, Chicago. Michael Jordan took him to lunch in his own restaurant in Chicago oh, gosh. and gave him box seats uh, at oh. the game. Yeah. How did you sell that dream to Michael Jordan? Well, you know, we just told him the story. Again, I'm a great fan of storytelling, and mm. you are too. And, yeah. uh, and uh, on my fax, not email, but fax at the time to Michael Jordan, um, he would have had to have been pretty hard not to have a tear in his eye. Yeah. I told the story about this little boy called Jay Campbell. Life was mm. not good for him. He was in a wheelchair, but he mm. was a master basketballer. He, at 15 years of age, he was in the New South Wales basketball wheelchair, wheelchair basketball. Oh. So he was, a, he was a gun basketballer. Mm. Michael Jordan looked at it. And when I asked Michael Jordan when we went there, um, what made him say yes? He said, I could not say no to that story. And did the same with Princess Di. She was wow. out here and um, we did the same thing for her. A little girl who'd lost a leg to cancer, unfortunately. Mm wanted to one day meet the princess and as it mm. turned out she was coming to Australia in a few weeks time I wrote to mm. Buckingham Palace got on the line to them and Princess Di said how can I say no? You know John you know, people out there are going oh yeah but I don't have spina bifida and I don't have uh, ambi but you know it's really the emotion and the passion and touching people's hearts isn't it? It is. Like, people it don't is. buy into fuzzy dreams because they were very clear weren't they? They were very real. The kids were very clear what they wanted mm. and also the fact that you touched people's emotions and I think Sometimes in society, in selling our dream, we're scared to think, oh, emotion's manipulative. But without emotion, you really don't exist. You're right. and You're it, lifeless. And Pat, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes when I'm writing these letters, telling the story, I, I do think, oh, is this manipulation? But, you know, the end result of that was is that we had 1.4 million people a week watching that TV program. Wow. It was up against Hey Hey It's Saturday. So we're up against a pretty tough opposition on Channel mm. 9. Mm. And we won the audience. And uh, we won the audience because I felt that, and I still feel this way, if I could do it these days, I would. There's too much bad news on TV. Mm. You turn on the news, it's bad news. You, mm. Before you go to bed, you turn on the news and it's bad news. A mm. movie comes on, they're shooting up 20 people with a machine gun. Yeah. This was delivering dreams to needy people. Wow. And we, I had a letter from one lady who said, thank you very, very much. And you, my name came up as the production company. And she said, I've never seen my husband cry for 24 years of marriage. And I saw him cry tears of joy in front of the TV tonight. Oh. I want to say thank you. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's amazing. You know, in, in, uh, in our business, we call it sometimes emotional direct, direct response, response marketing. Yeah. What is that? I mean, we hear a lot about it. I mean, our people in the club, they've probably heard about it and they probably have bought something. On, but what is it? 
really it's uh, tapping into what real estate agents already know. They know mm. that most people buy houses with their hearts, not their heads. And uh, it's taking that philosophy and putting it across all products. Mm. And uh, so there's five components of emotional direct response marketing. Number one is highlight the person's problem. Uh, and that might be, are you overweight? Number two, aggravate that problem. Well, summer's around the corner. Don't you want to look good in your swimsuit? Mm. Number three, provide the solution. Take this magic pill and look like a movie star, whatever it might be, or go on this Can particular... Can I get that pill, please? I'm, I'm ready to run, I'm ready to bite now. <laughs> I think we'd all want it, wouldn't we? I, I, I want to give you, give me a bottle. <laughs> if only there was that silver bullet for oh, us. Yeah. That wouldn't be awesome. And, um, and then number four, provide proof, which is normally testimonials. You mm. know, I did that, way, that, that diet course, or I took the pill. And number five, the call to action, call this number. So emotional direct response marketing is all about tapping into people's emotion. Mm. When... Um, when uh, we, we, you're in business, oftentimes you get caught up in thinking that, you know, I, I, I can only win their business on price. What's your take on that? Because I know your spin on it is very different. Absolutely. Mm. Um, price should be your last resort. Absolutely mm. your last resort. And a classic case of this, if you don't mind me showing off for two seconds, is the, uh, the building society that I got Seinfeld for. Yeah. Before he came along, I'd been involved with them for eight or nine years. And about mm. uh, ten years ago, I developed a campaign for them which said, get a home loan, get a free holiday. So in other words, when you came to the Greater Building Society, you paid 7.2% or whatever the interest rate was at the time, which was exactly the same as the banks, but you got a free holiday. Mm. Now, all they did to fund that is that they used to have a 1% honeymoon rate and that would last for a year. So you get your home loan for 6% and then a year later it would go up to 7%. I said, look, everyone's doing that. Think unbank, think mm. unfinancial institutions. Mm. So mm. therefore I said, look, I can get wholesale holidays, a $2,000 holiday for one. Why don't you say, look, we'll match the interest rate of the banks, but we won't give a honeymoon rate. They don't, they don't mention that, but they took the honeymoon rate away. They gave a free holiday to Fiji or, or, or the Gold Coast, mm. wherever it might be, depending upon your life. Their home loans quadrupled in the space of two years. Gosh. I wish I'd done a door deal, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so therefore, yeah. why, they, why that worked is they took everyone's eyes off the price onto the holiday. Mm. Guess what? For nine years, up until the GFC, for nine years, they were the only bank in the world that never advertised an interest rate. Can you believe that? Wow. So can you imagine, now McDonald's, mm. if you ask anyone that has children how mm. much is a Happy Meal, they can't tell you because no. the free toy forced them to buy for their children. <laughs> they didn't worry about the price. That's right. So the actual bonus, the wow factor can take mm. your eye off the price. So my advice to anyone is don't market on price because there's only one way to go. Don't go down, that's right. And, and you know, the thing is that once you start slashing your costs, you affect your income which affects what you can do with it, it affects your productivity, it affects staff morale. There's a trickle effect, isn't there, really, Absolutely. when it comes to that. Now, John, you, um, you really talk about repetitive trade marketing. What is that? I mean, it's a big word, simple concept. Johnny Farnham, sorry, I should say John Farnham. John Farnham Ooh, has a... Oh, careful, yeah, he's, yeah. he's one of our members too. Is Not really, right? folks, but... <laughs> Yes, uh, well, you know, he said it yep. in his song, one is the loneliest number. Mm. And it is, you can't have one customer once. You've got to make sure that you actually get them to come back and back and back and back. So I develop for my clients techniques where they do uh, have an incentive to come back. You know, look, the, the smart coffee shops do it, where they give you the little reward card. Mm. They clip the hole on the first one, and then if you get nine more coffees, they'll give you a free coffee. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Isn't it funny? You see that happening, but you don't really think that there's a science behind it. No? No? John, what's, what is the science behind it, and how can our people out there benefit from that? Okay, well, uh, uh, the, the science behind it is never, ever, ever let anyone come into your business uh, without getting their details. Mm. And I am a firm believer that 90, probably 95% of businesses in Australia do not collect a database. Mm. I can go to Dreamworld or Movie World here on the, on the Gold Coast and they won't know who I was. Okay, mm. If I join one of their special VIP clubs, they will. But generally speaking, if I go in with my teenagers mm. to Movie World, they'll ask for my postcode. I don't know mm. how that's going to help them. But they will <laughs> not get my email or my mobile or anything about me. And mm. you know what? You can walk into Bunnings. You can walk into even McDonald's. You can walk into just about any business in Australia. You can browse or shop and they will not ask who you were. Now, that's a cardinal sin. You know, the Rugby League Grand Final had 82,000 people. That's they don't ridiculous. know who they are. Absolutely. So in order to be able to have a chance of building repetitive trade, I would suggest to any business owner, don't let anyone out of your business without mm. getting their data and then communicate regularly with them. I want to sell my dream to people. I want to sell my business. I want to sell my life, my product, whether I'm a real estate, network marketer, <laughs> kazoo player. How can I attract free publicity? Okay. Yeah, right. Um, now, there's um, a reason why I'm asking that because people think you've got to spend millions of dollars to get publicity. You know, how do I, how do I, how do I do that? I, I believe, you, you know, you, you teach people, you encourage businesses to do that. How, how can they... 
they do that? Well, a classic case was that house that I sold. Um, I only told half the story where I took out a full-page advertisement, but what I also did is put out press releases. So in that same newspaper that day, which I think was probably what Ray Martin read more than the yeah. ad, was a half-page story in the real estate section about this guy selling this beautiful 14-acre property, blah, blah, blah. And because we had six children, or we have six children at the mm. time, they were a bit younger, the story was, you know, the Von Trapp family leave the country, <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, Ray Martin read, now that was free publicity. All mm. I did was put together a press release, again, storytelling, and that's what I would suggest every business does. Send out at least one or two press releases every month to your local newspapers, to your radio station, to your database, uh, mm. anywhere you possibly can, because guess what? Newspapers, any media are looking for stories. stories. And yours might just be the right one at the right time. If they mm. haven't found Elvis that day, you might be the big story. <laughs> So it's always a pleasure talking to you. Now, uh, you've got something that uh, I know is going to help a lot of our Mini Club members. And uh, uh, without revealing what it is, if they go to our library there, we'll be able to. You'll be able to access a uh, some free material. Obviously, that you've uh, the people pay quite a lot of money for. And I want to thank you, John, for making that accessible to our club members. My pleasure. And John, thanks for being part of us and part of our team and helping people prosper and uh, helping people's dreams come true. My pleasure, mate. How prosperous life. Thank Cheers. you, mate.